what we're going to talk about now is uh, the, the next question we ask is, uh, what is the one financial question you have? Actually, Andrea asked it. I didn't ask it. Well, <laughs> but this this really became the meat and potatoes of the whole thing, right? Because right. these were really good, and um, and I I felt inspired by a lot of these questions, and I really wanted to. I didn't just want to give you like, you know, the easy answer and move it on, and so. I really thought about them and I did research and so I am going to try and keep it short because otherwise, um, I mean, we could literally probably make five or six videos right. out of this if um, right. otherwise. So what I will do is um, as we go through these, I'll kind of touch on the most important things and then um, if you want more information, absolutely reach out and I can send you a full article that explains that particular topic or situation um, and then that way you can get all the details. Um, also, we could put the links in the show notes. We can okay. we can do all kinds of different things. Okay. You guys can reach out to Andrew. It's probably the easiest way to get him. Mm. Uh, you know, open up that conversation. Andrew is more than willing to talk to anybody about any of these topics. He's done a bunch of research on them. She's very knowledgeable on them. So feel free to reach out to her. All right. So the first question that we got. Um, how can I know what is going on with my money and not have constant anxiety and worry? And How amazing would that be? <laughs> but this is so common. Uh, so it wasn't difficult for me to find um, to, you know, articles and such on this. Um, and so kind of the, the best five things I can give you to try and focus on is automate your savings. So making that completely automatic it comes into your bank account and then it goes into your savings account or into your investment account or however you want that to look automate that so it's automatic and before you even have the chance to spend it it's saved so there in the event that something happens you have it so like participating in your employer plan having it come out of your check before it's even deposited into your account it's probably the easiest way to save for a retirement type goal comes out first thing, you never even see it, you don't have to worry about moving it, you don't have to worry about setting up automatic, it's, it's gone before you even get it. Right. Uh, stay away from impulse purchases. So just like I touched on being in the grocery store as a kid, so that unfortunately still occurs um, as adults and I'm sure you're all aware that they put all the little trinkets and such by the checkout while you're waiting and then you're like oh I now decided I need this when yeah, five minutes ago you didn't and so just kind of staying away from that I will say I think grocery pickup has personally assisted me in that um, because I don't go into the grocery store very much any longer uh, but but just trying to get away from that making a conscious effort um, to not allowing yourself to do that yeah, you find yourself standing in the checkout aisle. Next thing you know, you're like, "Oh, let's let's get some beef jerky." Let's. Next thing you know, you're just magazines, you're, you're gum, buying the Inquirer and so, things like that. Next thing you know, you got you know all this stuff you didn't need, but you were just bored standing there. So, trying to uh, you know stay away from impulse purchases. Easy Put your blinders on. Yeah, help you stay within your budget. Yeah. Um. And then focusing on what you can control, right? Because we're never going to be able to control the stock market. It's going to do what it's going to do, right? And so we can prepare um, and adjust our allocations accordingly for our risk tolerance. So we can control that. Um, we can control the amount that we put in our savings. We can control the amount that we spend. So all of those things, and again, this goes back to your plan. All of those things that we can control is where we need to put our focus and then the rest of that stuff we've accounted for because everything we can control we've got in place. Yep. Um, being more goal focused and oriented. So um, I feel like you have said this before but writing it down makes it real, right? So um, if you don't then it's just kind of something you want to happen. but. Putting it down on paper and just being like, yes, you know, I want to retire at 60 or I want to buy a boat or whatever those things may be, putting those goals down um, and then working toward them. And that becomes your focus. Um, we often talk about a dream without a plan is a wish. 
uh, quoted the uh, Little Prince author, right? Yes. I, I cannot pronounce his name. It's French. Can't do it. But I love that thought. That, it's a great quote. You know, until you write something down and give it a name and then say, this is what I'm planning on doing to do that. I mean, really, you're just wishing that it comes true. Right. So having a dream of retiring at 65 or 70 or whatever that is, but not having a plan in order to get there is just you're wishing. You're, you're hoping. wishing you're going to, when you get there, you're wishing that when you get there, there's going to be enough money for you to retire. Yeah. Creating a plan, revisiting it, revising the plan. It's a living plan. So once you, you, you're not carving it in stone so that it never changes. It's, it's going to change. It's going to change all the time. <laughs> right? But having that focus and creating a priority for it so that you do write it down, you do talk about it, you do look at it. I mean, that's that's all part of it. And that's what gives it the, you know, the, the meat, I'll say, of making it a priority. Right. Um, and then my favorite of all of them, ask questions. Um, the only, for me personally, I can't speak obviously for anyone else, but the only way that I feel empowered for things that scare me is by learning more about them. And so if you're really scared of this topic, try asking questions and learning more about it because you may find that the more that you know, maybe some of those fears that you have aren't necessarily valid. It's just really that you don't know. And right. so I think, um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, any financial professional should want you to learn more about your money and your situation. Um, but mo more importantly, you should feel very comfortable with that person because they're your teammate, right? Like they are there to coach you along this whole process um, to help you meet those goals. And so they want you to understand that. And so most definitely ask questions um, and don't be afraid to talk about it. Yeah, uh, Andrea and I in the past have talked about uh, if you don't feel comfortable enough uh, with an advisor to ask them questions about it, you know, you might want to take a look at seeing if there's a different advisor out there that you feel more comfortable with. Uh, one of the things, you know, Andrew and I talked about in this office, we have, you know, we have five advisors in this, just in this office with five different personalities. I mean, I'm, I'll say none of us are, I, you know, the same personality. So, you know, a lot of times it's just sitting down with somebody, getting comfortable enough with them that you feel like, you know what, I feel, I totally feel like I can ask Andrea this question and not feel like it's, you know, uh, an uneducated question. It's just, you, right. you need to know more about it. You just, you don't know. You're not a financial professional. You know, realistically, there's probably no reason you should know all of that. Right. It's not your job to know it. It's ours. <laughs> right. You're, it's not what you do every day. It's, you're not going to know all of those things. You know, and, and there's a lot of conversation, especially on social media, talks about financial literacy in high school, you know, even middle school, high school, college just doesn't really exist. So as you're, as you're growing up, you're learning a lot of those things on your own. We talked about extensively yesterday about people getting into credit card debt, you know, right out of high school or right out of college or, or whenever they're getting their life started, that the only way people really learn about the pitfalls of that is by experiencing it. Right. And, right, and then when you're in your 40s, 30s and 40s, you start talking to other people about it, and so many people have the exact same, same experience. experience. Right. And then you're like, why didn't somebody tell us, you know? Save us from that mistake. Right. Right. So. I, I was saved. I, we'll get there. Right, right. right. We but will. the majority of people do. Right. Um, all right. Next question. Next question. Was, if I'm ever widowed, will I be taken care of? And to be completely honest, I can't answer that specifically because I don't know that situation, right? But what I can tell you is I can recommend that you um, put some steps in place so that you feel comfortable and you know that in the event that that were to happen, you will be taken care of. So one one point here. So I'm no, you're fine. Take this is where, where this becomes important is is Andrea specifically asked women 
And statistically, women live longer than men. So this is a fantastic question for women to be asking because at some point, you know, statistically, More than likely. yeah, statistically, they're going to live longer. So they need to know this. That's a great question of what happens if I become, you know, the sole living, you know, spouse. Mm-hmm. How does all that stuff transfer? How, how do does, I take care of myself yeah. in the event? How do I take over all these assets? Right. How, how does all that right. transition happen? You know, understanding the game, and you know, I believe it's half the battle. Just understanding your options, right? Life is all about options, right? Do it because you want to, not because you have to, right? That's Somebody told me that a long time ago that, you know, uh, Having the option doesn't mean you have to do it, but at least you have the option. Right. Uh, yeah, you're in control. <laughs> uh, yeah, so on that topic, I think it, first, I think what's most important is that you have an advisor that right. you are comfortable with. So, you know, let's say you're in a situation where your husband does handle most of this and you don't really know that advisor well if your husband passes that's not going to be a comfortable transition for you because yes your husband trusted that person and you probably can too i'm not saying you shouldn't but you want to feel comfortable with that person and so i feel like that relationship needs to be established well before if possible well before um you know you're faced with this challenge because that challenge is going to seem less of a challenge if if you're comfortable in that situation already. So I think first and foremost, you need to find an advisor that you feel comfortable with. And I, I would recommend interviewing multiple advisors because like we talked about in this office, five different personalities, you know, it's every person you sit down with is gonna have a different personality, but you finding that comfort zone is the most important thing. Somebody you feel like you can be open and honest with, you can ask those questions. It's it's just a huge benefit for you to be feel like that's the first person I want to call because I trust them, I feel comfortable talking to them, and they know my situation. Right, and that's what that's what you want. Um, and then have a plan. Have a plan. So, so again, in order to know what you know what we're dealing with, we gotta have a plan. We gotta put it on paper, and we need to figure out what we have and what we want things to look like, and all of that. So we gotta create that plan. Then we also need to think um, beyond the single and the primary beneficiary, okay? So a lot of people don't worry about, well, that's my beneficiary. And then they set it, forget it, and then years go down the road. And what if that person passes and there wasn't a contingent? And so, again, that goes back to meeting with the professional looking at the titling of all those accounts, looking at the beneficiaries of all those accounts and making sure and revisiting those. Like, I know that's something we try to at least do on an annual basis, if not more often, and just rechecking those beneficiaries, making sure that those are still the same people that you want those assets to pass to in the event that um, you were to pass. And that goes on for your spouse as well, right? Because more than likely, you're probably going to be his beneficiary. And so, um, just looking at all of those and talking about those things. And it's not always the most fun conversation, but it's a lot easier when it happens if you've already had that conversation. Um, and then making sure that you're regularly updating your will, your estate plans, your trust. Uh, your will sh- should at least be looked at every five years. That doesn't mean you need to make changes, but you at least need to have them looked at um, to make sure that everything is still the way that you want it to be. Um, thinking about your own health and um, medical directives, making sure in the event that you were to become incapacitated, that's one of the, really one of the worst things that can happen a lot of times because that's one that doesn't get planned for a lot. And so, um, because then you're living, but you can't make any decisions. And if you don't have things in place for somebody to make those decisions, it's just not a good situation. And so um, really making sure that those documents are in place in the event that it happens. Hopefully it doesn't, but it could. Um, You want to make sure your wishes are known. Yeah. Whatever they are. Just like your financial plan, your, you know, estate plans, all the, those are making sure people understand what you want done with your life, with your assets, all all of those things. Just making sure 
it's written down somewhere and people know this is where you go to find out what I want to happen in this situation. Right. And so these are conversations too that you need to have with your spouse um, so that you together can create these documents, right? Because it's obviously more likely that the wife will outlive. Um, Statistically, yeah. But that doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. Right. So just making sure that together you get this done. Um, and yeah, then, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I keep filming. I keep talking. Go ahead. Uh, your financial team is more than just your advisor. Right. It's your your attorney, your CPA, or accountant. You know, however you know whoever you work with, getting those people all on the same plane. Right. All on the same page and understand them having communications with you. Making sure everybody understands, make sure all of those pieces are completed, and then you you have this full picture, you know, includes your you know insurance agents for you know property and casualty and all of those things to make sure you know all of your assets are protected and everything's in alignment. So if any of those situations were to ever come up, those people say, hey, you know what? We've already talked about this before. This is how this goes down. Right. It is only to your benefit that those people collaborate. Absolutely. Uh, Something you can consider uh, doing is transferring some assets as gifts um, earlier on. So that way you can maybe get some of that, depending on you know what type of asset situation you have. If you've got quite a bit and your um, beneficiaries are gonna have a pretty decent tax implication, then you can start transferring those things while you're living if you're not going to need them. and. Um, you can do that up to a certain amount each year tax free. So maybe that's something to look at so that we're saving, you know, your heirs some taxes in the end. Because again, nobody really wants Uncle Sam to get any more than he has to, right? So the more we can save, the better. Um, the more of your money you can keep, the better off you'll be. And then choosing an executor. So that's just the person that's going to make sure that what you wanted to happen is what happens. And so you just want to make sure that they have the maturity to do that. And they may need, depending on the situation, they may need to have a pretty strong backbone um, to have some pretty tough conversations. Um, and they need to be willing to deal with any challenges that could be involved. They may have to go to court hearings. They may have to deal with some relatives. So you just sure. want to make sure whoever that executor is, um, you know, they're the right person to really sure. be able to handle some of that responsibility. Um, Cause it, some, I mean, my husband was the executor of his dad's estate. It wasn't a challenging one, uh, luckily, cause it was very much a surprise, which is why this particular topic is so important to me. Um, because it just would have been so much easier if we would have been able to ask. If we had just five more minutes to ask some questions, it would have made life so much easier on him. And, uh, but you know, he was lucky. And sometimes being an executor is not fun. And yeah. so I think, um, you know, just finding that right person is a good idea. Am I on track to retire when I want to? Again, I don't know this particular situation, so I can't say yes or no, but, with my handy dandy planning software, I couldn't answer that question um, with some with answers. some information. Yeah, yeah, with the answer to a few questions. Uh, but I will tell you um, the four most common mistakes that we found um, again for some articles that I read of pre-retirees are neglecting to create a retirement plan. Have a plan. Uh, waiting to start saving. Start early. And understanding health care and long-term care costs. So we really haven't touched on this one too much yeah, yeah. yet. Um, we, we talked about it inflating a little bit quicker than, than goods. But, but other than that, some of those costs can be up there. And, and again, women tend to live longer than men. And so they are going to be more likely to, to need to utilize um, a long-term care facility. And so... Um, with the help of that software, I am also able to run insurance analysis and, and see if that's something that, that A, you would need, and B, how much you could need, um, because th that does tend to be pricey as well, and so trying to figure out that dance and that balance to where it's, it's worth it. Um, and then the fourth one is 
under utilizing tax advantaged accounts. So one thing we haven't mentioned, and I feel like this is one of Brett's favorite things to talk about, is in our planning software, we're able to run different scenarios. And so if you are contributing to a Roth instead of a regular IRA, how that can affect your plan over 20 years. And we're able to do that literally with a click of a button. It's so simple. And so, um, you know, maybe looking at the different ways that we can maybe save you some tax money um, just by the type of account or the way that we do things can make it, you know, a pretty big impact. And so those are the four most common mistakes and you should try and avoid them all. <laughs> All right, the next question, what is the minimal amount of money recommended for people uh, for retirement? So again, this is going to be different for every household because spending is different, but kind of basic rule of thumb, and um, I think you can find this a lot of places. I found it from ally.com is where I got it, but um, at age 30, you should have one time your income. At age 40, you should have three times your income saved. At age 50, you should have five times your income saved. And at age 60, you should have seven times your income saved. So um, that's a little bit better, I think, than saying you need to have a million dollars saved because if I'm not a big spender, I may not need a million dollars. Or if I'm a heavy spender, I may need more than that. So kind of looking at your income and basing it off that is going to probably be a better depiction of um, what you're used to. Also, uh, geographical locations, yeah. whether you have high prices. You, I mean, somebody living in, say, New York City compared to somebody, you know, living in rural Indiana. I mean, your, your, costs, are, your right. costs are just going to be different. So very specific to each person's situation. I mean, I... I you know, when you sit down and you look at that as a rule of thumb, you know, you don't want to use it to discourage people because, you know, somebody might, you know, I, I may look at it and say, five times my income, you know, but you go through that scenario and you're like, you know, you might get, you know, I'll say uh, depressed looking at it. But in actuality is you may not need five times at this point. So setting down, doing the math, having the conversation is a huge part of that. It's all part of the plan. Right, asking the questions, getting those answers, and then adjusting the plan accordingly. Right, uh, and then this, I found this article and I thought that it was um, related and relevant. So it was three retirement roadblocks for women. <clears throat> and the roadblocks were um, reason, basically the, the things that put us behind um, for retirement. The first one was, women frequently put others first. So we tend to put our careers on hold to raise children or to care for elderly parents or you know whatever it may be. It tends to be women that take that role. So that obviously is going to affect things. Um, right or wrong, it's reality. Women are more likely to earn less than men. So that's obviously not helping us retirement-wise. And then by nature, we also tend to lack a plan for retirement. So you gotta get a plan. So the roadblock, or how to get around those roadblocks, right? We're gonna expect the unexpected. So we're gonna plan for those emergencies so that those emergencies aren't roadblocks. We're gonna ask the right questions. We're gonna talk about this and we're gonna you know, ask what we don't know and what we wanna know. And then that way, we're gonna feel empowered by it. Um, start investing now. Just get started. That's the best way to do it. Just get started. And then seeking a high quality and a balanced mix of savings and investments. So again, that mix is going to be different for everybody, every situation, every stage of life. But finding a professional to help you figure those things out so that you are on the right track um, and you're ready for retirement when it's, when it's um, around the corner. Yeah, you know, speaking with a professional, again, gives you options they they could be aware of situations or opportunities that you're not familiar with that as a person staying home taking care of an elderly parent you know there are still retirement options that you would have that you could contribute to if possible and stuff that you could do 
you know, that you may not be familiar with. So sitting down and asking those questions to a financial professional will help those things come to light. And then you're just, okay, so I do have an option that I could continue to save for retirement while I'm taking care of a, an elderly parent or, you know, whatever that situation is. Just having those conversations, you know, gives you options. And knowledge is power, as they say. That's right. Um, okay, the next question. At what net worth is long-term care not needed? Um, unfortunately, I don't think that there's a specific number. However, I do think there's an answer to this. I just think it's going to be different for every household. And I know you're probably sick of hearing me say that, <laughs> but that's reality. I wish that this was a cookie cutter thing because my job would be a lot easier, but it also would be a lot less fun. Well, um, on, that, on that point, right, that's a, we get that a lot of time from people. People are like, well, how much money does somebody need to save? And you're like, well, it's, it's not that easy. Right. What do you want to do with your life? Yeah. Let's talk about that. What, do you, you want know? to travel in retirement or you, you just want to, you know, stay right where you're at? I mean, there's right. so many things. What are your expenses? What is your income? Do you have a pension? Are you getting Social Security? I mean, there's so many questions that need to be answered that just, you know, asking somebody that question without all of those answers is so extremely difficult to answer. Right. So... In order to answer that, I would actually, you know, I would have to know your specific situation. But I will tell you um, why women need to plan for long-term care. We've touched on some of it a little bit, but statistically, we're going to live out outlive men. So there's reason one. Um, women are becoming uh, at higher risk for health problems and um, heart disease as definitely on the rise with women. Um, my former life was in fitness and that was actually one of our focuses. It was educating women about heart disease and how it is not just something that's gonna kill men. And so um, so that particular, you know, that resonates a little bit with me there. Um, the affordability of long-term care is an issue and so um, really educating yourself to what those expenses would be and if you're able to afford them and you know those are all reasons to talk to a professional and then just in general again going back women tend to not plan as much for retirement so a part of that retirement planning is long-term care right potentially you may need it and so um, if we if we tend to not plan for retirement, we're probably not planning for long-term care. So that's just something we need to be made aware of. And then again, women tend to provide care for their elderly parents more so um, than the, the male spouse. And so just really being aware of what that looks like, what's involved in it, what those costs are, like all of those are reasons to just familiarize yourself with LTC and what all is involved in it. All right, what is the ideal 401k contribution percentage with an employer match for someone in their early 30s? I know again, going back, we kind of touched on this earlier. The basic rule of thumb is at age 30, you should have at least one time your income saved. But um, I don't know, I just felt like I needed to give you more for, for that millennial generation. And I found an article that was six common Money management mistakes made by millennials. Easy to say. Huh? Easy to say. <laughs> Money management mistakes made by millennials. Six of them. So, number one, spending beyond your means. Um, this was luckily something that my dad was pretty hard on us about growing up and just... You don't spend more than you can afford. So I, luckily, that wasn't um, something that was hard for me to learn, I guess, because I didn't know any different. But that can get you into some trouble pretty early on. Um, so that one is one to avoid. Not staying on top of your credit. So we talked about this a little bit. Um, yeah, you can get yourself in trouble pretty quick with credit cards, especially some of those rates um, can get pretty salty. And so... Again, just try and, I mean, you want to be able to establish credit when you're young, so you want to have those things, and you have to use it in order to do so, and, sure. I, and I, so I fully obviously understand that, but you can't let it get out of hand, because it can happen pretty quick. Right, um, quickly. Then, not, mistake, not creating or sticking to that budget. So, Brett is like the budget guru, 
and he has an extremely detailed budget. So if you need any budget assistance, I would strongly recommend him as a resource. Um, we have a budget, but it I feel like yours like gleams when you open it. Like <laughs> Well, I've just over it's evolved over time. I've been using it for I believe three years and it's just grown, right? It was they used to be really big blocks and then it got down you know, another level down to where it's right, it's the the theory of you assign every dollar a, a spot, right? You know where all of those dollars are going, zero balance budget. So at the end of the month, every dollar has been assigned somewhere, even if it's discretionary spending, eating out, saving, you know, whatever those categories are, you just assign all of them and then you do everything in your power to try and follow that budget. That's, it's served well, right? It served well, and sometimes it's tough, right? right? Some of those those emergencies come up, and you're like, "Oh, well, I could just, you know, do." It. It's like, "Well, yeah," but then long term, you're you're sacrificing multiple goals because you didn't have enough in the emergency to cover that. Okay, so now your new goal is increasing the emergency, and you know all of those things. It just it leads to a better financial position if you do invest some time in it, and it really doesn't take that much time. I don't think, you know, maybe. Maybe fifteen or twenty minutes once a week, yes. Sunday night or whatever. Just and if that saves you stress, well worth it. So, yeah. yep. um, not saving for retirement. I feel like uh, a lot of people, even in, in my age bracket, and I'm forty, are um, like when I talk to them about saving for retirement, they kind of laugh. Like, why would I be focused on that? And I'm like. Because now if you focus on it, it's a lot easier than waiting 10 right. years or 20 right. years. And so, um, so yeah, if you can get started and you're 30, go for it. That's the best situation. Time is your friend. And compounding interest, we talk about that a lot. And just, it, do, it doesn't hurt so much if you start early. And so, absolutely, um, get that started. The earlier, the better. Um, failing to plan for emergencies. I feel like a lot of these answers are, are common, but, sure. th but that should also tell you that, you know, these basic five things are going to really help a lot. Um, and then lack of understanding money basics. So I think, too, that goes back to having those conversations, asking those asking questions, questions, you know, reading things. Just, you don't have to get into the iron butterfly. But, like, figuring out, like, stocks, bonds, what those mean, those types of things. Um, just familiarizing yourself with that w would really help. Yeah. Financial literacy. Like Andrea is saying, you don't need to know every detail of it, but just having an understanding of why companies issue stock. And, you know, what are bonds? What is fixed income? And those things, just understanding that, you know, kind of maybe the 35,000 foot view understanding what your portfolio is so that way you know what you own that's a, that's a big deal right. you know andrea talks about these five steps or whatever uh five or six steps you know or keep getting repeated because it, it's literally those are the foundations and the basics of it and you just fine tune it and you just fine tune it and you take it one more step and you take it one more step and you're looking at protecting all of your assets and you know how do you cover your liability so if something was to happen and you were passed you don't transfer those liabilities on to, to your spouse your children business partners whatever all of those things are you know it's just it's putting yourself in a position that you know you help create a legacy for when you're gone uh, your legacy you know, was, hey, they they valued us enough to say, I want to spend time on this. So when I'm gone, you guys don't have to worry about the stuff that I had or, you know, what, whatever that conversation is or however you want that legacy to look like. It's, it's just, it's so much bigger than just saying, hey, I want to build a budget. Well, then that leads to so many things. Op options, options, options right. is what I think of it as. Well, and I think, too, I think ladies in general tend to be more nurture-focused. It's probably why we are the ones that stay sure, home and, sure. and such. And I think the comfort of knowing that things are taken care of when you pass and, and the, your loved ones and that process is easier on them, I think, um, I don't know, I just think that that probably 
not necessarily resonates with us more, but I, I feel like we get it. Well, a lot, a lot of times. find it important. A lot of times you're putting yourself second, right? Right. So, you know, at the same time while you're doing that, though, you need to make sure you are taking care of yourself through, you know, making good, sound financial decisions. Which in turn ends up taking care of everyone else, too. Right. I mean, really, that's why yeah, so what I used to tell everybody um, in my fitness life is you have to take care of yourself because so many moms wouldn't work out or whatever, but you can't be the best mommy that you can be if, if you aren't taking care of you. So it goes the same way, right? right? Like you can't take care of your kids or your spouse or whatever that may be for your situation if you're not taking care of yourself. Same thing. Um, I feel like I always segue my fitness in this. I, I know, but that's <laughs> what I was getting ready to lead into them. That, you know... Fitness, I mean, we, we know that that helps with reducing stress and it can help you be more focused. I mean, the, those it totally goes hand in hand. I want to planning, yeah, I to, 100% agree with that. Uh, we'll have her phone number and email address and that stuff. And if you have a related financial question that you want to pose to Andrea, she love the opportunity to help you find the answer for whatever the question is you have we'll also have our contact information for all of our social media and everything uh on the slide after this feel free to reach out to us follow us on social media like comment you know uh let's start the conversation let's, let's talk about it yeah let's <laughs> remove some of this uh tabooness around it and let's talk about you know what our investments and you know, and you know, if you get to the point you want help with the budget, you want help with a plan, whatever that is, you know, whatever you want to get moving on to, you know, reach out to us. We'd love to sit down and talk to you about it. Once again, Brett Rice, the Core Vision Financial Group, joined today by Andrea Lee, also from Core Vision Financial Group. Uh, thanks for watching the video.